In today's video, I want to chat to you guys about how to sign up new clients. Good day. My name is Heinrich Gebeer. I'm the owner of SA Accounting Network and I've been in the accounting industry since 2008, but I've also been an entrepreneur since 1993, so I've been around the block a couple of times. I recently had the opportunity to come present to a group of business people at a place called Peak Academy and um, I really enjoyed this presentation and I thought that the guys on YouTube will also find a lot of value in, the, in this video itself. So have a look at this video, remember one second just to give the video a like, subscribe to my channel and then we can get on to the presentation, then you can have a look for yourself. So, yeah, so my name is Heinrich Gruvier, as most of you guys know, I've, I'm in the accounting industry. And I think I've been in the accounting industry since 2008, but I've been an entrepreneur since 1993. So I'm going on to 30 years that I've had my own businesses. I think I only ever worked for somebody for three months. Then I said, no, this is not for me. <laughs> and then I started my first business. I've been around the block a couple of times. And I think that the, the thing that I want to discuss with you guys today is, is, is a follow up on what Steve talked about last week. Remember, or oh, last month he was talking about networking skills and, and that type of stuff. And, um, you know, so I think afterwards we had a discussion and I think I did mention it here as well, is that over the years I've seen a lot of people start small businesses um, or people that, that let's say, for instance, is technically minded, so like mechanics and plumbers and builders and those type of guys who's excellent with, with the work that they do, but they don't know how to present themselves and how to sell themselves to other people. And then I said to, to, to Steve that I, I really want to do this talk because there's a lot of value um, in, in, in the talk that I'm going to present to you guys. And I think where it originally started, I was speaking to JP just now, and he was saying that he's watched some of my YouTube videos. So when I started with the project, um, when I started doing my YouTube videos, I thought, you I better do some research on just some presentation skills of how to present yourself. And then I came across a girl's book. I, I've read two of her books. I'm going to show you guys this now as well. Her name is Vanessa Van Edwards, and she wrote a book called Captivate, and this second book's name is Cues. And this thing, she just gives you a lot of practical tips of how to engage with people. You know, just uh, today's session is just about nuts and bolts. I'm not going to give you guys a magic formula or a golden bullet and say do this and you'll get every client that you meet, you're going to sign that person up. But if you don't, you, the thing is you don't know what you don't know. And it's nice just to go through these nuts and bolts and just make sure that they have all the basics sorted out. So I think if we can just get my slides on the screen, because I think this is so an Andre's one. And then once we have that up and running, then we can <coughs> get going. Is it working? Yes. <coughs> so obviously the talk that I'm going to present with you guys today is how to sign up new clients. And, and I used to belong to a church up in Johannesburg. And this was my head pastor over there, Pastor Dennis Stone. And he was an excellent businessman. And he always made a statement, or he, was, he ran a very successful business before he went into full-time ministry. And he made this statement. He said, if he can master relationships, he would never have to look for a client in your whole life. So I think that is one of the keys of to make business work. Because <coughs> if you can get this right, as he said rightly, that he don't he would ever have to look for a client in your life. So the talk that I'm going to be talking and streaming with the guys is how to sign up new clients. And obviously, um, I've got a little bit of bonus material that I want to share with you guys first before we get into the actual talk that I want to do with you guys. But, but it's important for us to understand the basics before we start looking at how to sign up new clients. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is what to do when you meet somebody for the first five seconds, because that's really, really important. So they did a study at the Harvard University where they showed muted 10-second videos of professors and then 5 seconds and then 2-second videos and rated them on 15 dimensions including warmth and likability. And as what is interesting that the rating stayed the same. So whether they showed a video clip of somebody talking for 15 minutes, for, f for 15 seconds, for 5 seconds or for 2 seconds. If you just show the guys just that video clip and say, okay, what do you think of this person? Whether they showed 10 seconds or 2 seconds, the ratings didn't change. So within the first 2 seconds, you actually make an assessment whether you actually like that person, whether you trust that guy, and whether you actually want to work with that person, which is really, really interesting. And um, so, so when we meet people, we try and answer three questions, basically. Is this person that you're meeting, is this person a friend or a foe? Second thing is, is this person a winner or a loser? And I think the third thing is, is this person for me or against me? So at this point, I had a very interesting um, conversation once. Uh, another accountant contacted me, and he asked me to do a valuation for, for a buyout that they wanted to do. So they were uh, at a transport business up in Alberton. And um, so, so the, he had his client, the guy's name was, was Yuan, and they had another gold car and that they wanted to buy the business out. So they asked me if I can't do a business valuation for car. And when I sit, sat with car, yes, I was betting with her. She just wouldn't cooperate with me. And then I actually 
had to sit there down and say, listen, Corin, I'm actually for you. I'm actually on your side. You know, my intention for you is I want to have you walk out of this deal as a winner. And when you click that thing that I'm actually for it, then the whole thing changed, the whole dynamic between us. So that's a very interesting observation to do when you meet somebody for the first time. So our first impressions lies not in what you say, but how you say it. And this is really important. <coughs> so you only have one chance to make a first impression. So first impressions are really, really, really really important because you only have one chance to make that first impression with a new client. So first five seconds. How do you make a good first impression? And they talk about using a triple threat. So there's three things. The first thing is your hands. Second thing is your posture. And the third thing is eye contact. So those are the three important things when you're trying to make a first impression with a new client. So why hands? Um, when you guys meet somebody for the first time, I know they always talk about this, but what is the first thing that you look at? Just generally, anybody, face. Somebody else? A lot of people say shoes. The girls like to wait and look at that's shoes. That's what I yeah. <coughs> so the theory um, is what we look at first is actually hands. And so the reason why they said that the hands um, shows intent and whether you have in your hand, whether you've got a gift in your hand or whether you've got a weapon in your hand. So they take it back to the medieval days if somebody came to visit you, you're sitting in a shack over there and somebody's coming walking over the hill and the first thing you try and look and see what this, this guy got in his hand. He's coming with a spear to come and attack you or is this guy bringing a gift to you to do like a peace type of a thing. So that's why you'll see that if I stand like this and I stand with my hands behind the back, then it's just a matter of time, especially if I fiddle behind my back, you guys are going to start getting uncomfortable because you don't know what I'm busy doing with my hands, whether I'm going to pull out a weapon behind my back and start shooting you guys, or whether i am actually got a gift for you guys. So I, this is really, really important that, um, that when you meet people for the first time, your hands are really important. And I think um, we'll go a little bit into it now as well. So the youngsters, when they stand with their hands in their pockets and stuff like that, is a really, really bad thing. You know, especially when you meet clients, you have to keep your hands visible. Um, so TED Talks. So they did a study. Have you guys ever watched TED Talks? So those are those talks, those motivational talks and stuff. So they, so these guys in that book, Captivate, they talk about this where they did and analyze um, these TED Talks to see what is the difference between top ranking TED Talks and what is the difference between lower ranking TED Talks. And they actually went physically and counted the amount of hand gestures that these guys did in the talk. And the top performing talks, in 18 minutes, they used 600 hand gestures, where the bottom guys, look, they've got the least amount of views, only got 270 hand gestures that they used. So the way that you that you work with the hands is really, really important because they say that your hands is a second mode of communication. It becomes the second story that you're telling. And it relays confidence and what you are saying. So I think just one thing that I want to add over here, why hands are really important when you, um, when they talk about the second mode of communication, this is really, really important when you speak to new clients is you must always try and get the maximum amount of modes of communication going with that person because the more you can get it right, the more confident you're going to look in that presentation. So what I do with all my first clients, I mean, some of you guys have been in my office before, but the very first meeting, I take a pen and paper, I sit the guy down, I switch off my phone, we'll talk about phones just now as well, and then I'm fully engaged with that person for that one hour. I always say if I can get somebody to sit in my office for an hour, I can sign him up as a client. So the first thing is I make sure that I'm fully engaged with the person with my hands and I'm explaining to him concepts about tax and all that type of stuff. But then on the paper as well, I'm actually drawing pictures with the guys and drawing timelines and that type of stuff. So now if somebody is looking at me that's receiving the presentation, they can say, listen, this guy is fully confident in what he's saying. He's explaining with his hands what he's busy trying to teach to me. And he can see pictures of what I'm busy explaining to them as well. So the more modes of communication you can get with new clients, the better the chances are because you're just going to look more credible. So that's really, really interesting. Um, the thing about hands, let's quickly see poker players. So this is also an interesting study that they did this. They, <coughs> they tried to figure out what it is that gives away poker players, but it's actually the hands that gives away whether you've got a good deck of cards or whether you've got a bad deck of cards. So the fluidity of your hands is what gives poker players away. So a lot of people think now you've got to stand the eyes and stuff, but it's actually the hands that gives them away. <laughs> interesting. So do's, let's quickly see. Never miss a handshake. Somebody spoke about handshakes. It was JPR. So handshakes are really important. And I think just the way that you that you do handshakes, I mean, you guys can go do some research, you know, what is the best way to do it, whether you've got to crunch the guy or just like a slip pop hunt, hunt skit. You've got to do it properly, you know. You mustn't play around with the handshake. Just, just professionally, you know. You don't want to kill the guy. 
keep your hands visible. We were talking about it just now. It's really important when you meet people for the first time, not to stand with your hands in your pocket, hands behind the back and stuff like that. We'll talk about phones now. Keep your hands above a desk. So when you guys are sitting in a business meeting and you have people sitting around the table like that, don't sit with your hands underneath the table because the people can't see what you're doing with your hands if you've got it below the table. So you have to always make sure that you keep your hands above the table. Keep it visible because then the people can see what your intention are with your hands. So that's quite important as well. Um, <coughs> use a clicker or pen for presentations. So you can see that is what I'm doing. So I have something to use my hands for and it doesn't look like I'm standing and fiddling and that type of stuff. We'll talk about that now as well. Um, a couple of cool drink and networking events. So when you walk around networking with people, that's also important because a lot of people don't know what to do with their hands, you know, so they start fiddling because they feel uncomfortable and they feel nervous and stuff. Where if you just stand with a bottle of water, you know you have something to occupy your hands and you obviously just doesn't look like you're fidgeting and stuff like that. So that's really a good tip. Uh, relax hands when listening. So I think that's also really important when you listen to people. You don't want to sit and fiddle around and draw too much attention. So normally if you would sit down, you would just sit with the hands crossed like this on the table like this. And if you're just standing, you just stand relaxed with the hands on your sides like that while you're busy talking to people or when people are busy talking to you because you obviously don't want to <coughs> take them uh, away from them what they're busy saying. Uh, let's quickly see don'ts. So hands in pockets. So I think that's really, really important, especially with the youngsters. I think that's one of the first lessons that we need to use and teach the youngsters is, is bad. You know, it's just the way we'll talk about posture just now as well, but the hands in pockets is a bad thing. Fidgeting. So I think if you sit and fidget the whole time, it's really bad as well for presentations because it just distracts everybody. Having your hands behind the back is also not good. Rubbing arms. So if I stand here and I'm doing this presentation and, and I'm rubbing my arms the whole time like this, and then you guys are gonna think, what the heck is this guy doing? Uh, wringing your hands. So if I stand here and I talk like this to you guys the whole time, you're going to think, no, this guy looks really, really nervous. Rubbing the back of your neck. So if I stand and do my presentation like this, rubbing my back of my neck like this, and you guys are going to think, what the heck is this guy doing? Uh, next one, let's quickly see, stroking your calves or thighs. So a lot of people, when they sit down, um, they sit and then they sit and rub their, their, their legs like this. So that's also bad because people look at this and think, What's happening? I mean, they don't do it intentionally, but it doesn't look very professional if you sit and uh, they talk about self-soothing as the, the, the thing over there. Cracking knuckles. I luckily don't do it. My son does it from time to time, but that's, no, don't, don't crack your knuckles because then it looks like you're looking for a fight. Biting nails. Shame, shame gestures. So this is a really interesting thing. A lot of people, when they, when they talk, they do, don't do it intentionally, but as soon as they come across something that they're not 100% sure about, the first thing is they start rubbing their forehead like this. So if you see this in the meeting, then you know, listen, this guy's touching on a subject now where people feel a little bit uncomfortable about talking. You'll see, especially when people speak about money, that is normally the first thing because they like start worrying and say, what the heck, where am I going to get money to pay for this? So those are type of cues that you can actually look at when you're doing a business meeting as well. So if you're engaging with a client and you're busy going through a presentation and all of a sudden the guy starts doing this or you start frowning like this, then you can just pause there, don't continue with the presentation, then just ask a couple of questions. So listen, do you understand? Is there anything you want to discuss? further about this topic that we're busy talking about because otherwise you're going to miss the excuse and you're going to go past that topic that you're busy talking about and you might lose that potential client so I think that's really important <coughs> adjusting clothing and I think especially for the girls this is a, a, a dangerous thing because lo quite often the girls like to wear like bangles and chains and stuff like that so if you sit and fiddle on your makeup and or on your on your clothing the whole time then people think oh but this guy doesn't look very professional or you look nervous and I think that is what you're trying not to do you don't want to look nervous when you're meeting people for the first time and I think pointing so that's probably more for presentations if I stand here and I say listen you guys mustn't do this and this and this then you're not going to feel very comfortable. So they said that you should actually pinch. So if you want to explain something, you pinch like this and then you do it like that because you're not pointing to the person. You actually just want to highlight the specific point that you're actually raising with the person over there. How am I doing on time? I just want to quickly check here. No, I still have enough time. <coughs> Explanatory gestures. So this is quite interesting. So we're still busy with the hands. So I can't believe how much you can actually talk about the hands. So <clears throat> if you explain stuff with the hands, it improves your comprehension with up to 60%. Um, the second medium of, of communication, I did explain to you guys just now when I meet clients for the first time, what I do with my hands and stuff like that, to make sure that I've got three modes of communication going. So better to know the subject, or well, the better you know the subject, the better you can demonstrate it with the hands. So you must always try and communicate with the hands as well while you're busy doing presentations. Explanatory gestures. 
So um, when to gesture, um, I think when you want people to understand you, so I think that's quite important because as soon as you start explaining with your hands, people can say, listen, you actually know what you're doing, uh, to show that you're confident in what you're saying. Because I think once you start using gestures with your hand, people realize that, that what you're saying, you're actually not thinking about what you're saying, you can actually go into your second mode of communication with that person as well to explain stuff with the hands as well because then it just obviously builds confidence. So to be more engaging also on videos. So I think this is quite interesting. A lot of people when they shoot videos and obviously I've been a little bit involved with YouTube and stuff like that. A lot of people cut themselves off over here at the shoulders and they just record the stuff part over here. But once again, you can't see hands. You don't know what the intention is of that person. So if ever you have to do videos, try and record the top half so that people can actually see what you're busy doing with the hands. Remember, you want to try and get as many communication channels going with potential clients. I think um, when not to gesture, so that's just as important. So if you don't want people to look at you, but it's slides or drawings, so it's when you're um, presenting technical stuff. So people who's in the building industry and engineers and those type of guys, and um, even guys that probably do web design and SEO and stuff like that. If you want a person to concentrate on the screen, what you're busy explaining to the guy, then you don't want to come fiddle around with the hands and distract him off from what you're busy presenting to the guy. So then it would just turn your hands down a little bit and let the people rather focus on the technical side of things. When people are staring at you, so they say hands should be backup dancers and not the show. So I think if you just gesture the whole time and you overdo it, then people's going to think, no, but this doesn't look authentic, you know, then you're overdoing it probably if people start staring at you because you have your arms waving all over the place. Uh, when listening, um, so that's also important. I did talk about it just now, but that's a good example of humility. And so you just sit with the hands crossed and just sit and listen to the car. When it's your chance to turn to talk, then you can start stepping up the hands game. Yeah, first five seconds. Um, next one, power for palm. So this is also an interesting thing. It's just this gesture, this piece of your hand relays a lot of what you're busy saying. <clears throat> it commands attention. It's an upgrade from explanatory gestures. If you start working with your palms, Everybody loves palms because I think people can see intent when they start looking at your palms. Um, and uh, obviously, once again, they're not concealing anything. Do you guys know who that is? Evita Baron. Yeah, Evita Baron. So she was very famous for her palm flashes. So she used to stand on the stage and she would do this because people can see the palms of her hands. And because of that, she built trust in the way that she was using with her hands. So that's quite interesting. I think. Um, we mustn't do it the whole time because if I stand in front of you guys and say, <laughs> so guys, this is what I'm saying now. It's not going to work well. Um, if you want attention, what do you do? You wave. So listen, guys, Andre did it just now when we started the talk. So listen, guys, come, come. It's time for us to start now. <coughs> I want a teacher to see you. You raise your palm facing towards him. So listen, teacher, I want to speak to you quickly. Uh, if you want somebody to stop, you, um, you obviously raise your palm facing towards them. If a uh, car's driving towards them, you want the car to stop, you obviously point him like that. Um, palms can speak for you. So in meetings, call on me, flash palm to the group. So if you're busy sitting around the table and people are just talking, 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 they're not giving you a chance uh, a, you a chance to talk, you just raise your hand quickly. As soon as you raise your hand, it draws attention to you and people say, okay, but Heinrich actually wants to say something. So that is quite important. Um, a giving gesture, so holding palms, palms out there is to give something when <coughs> sharing an idea. So obviously, like when I'm sharing this presentation, I would quite often use my palm to share like I'm giving you guys a gift. So I think that's quite important. If you don't understand, so that is the gesture my little maniki is doing over there. And then let me explain, so once again, the palm towards the slide. So I think palms is a, is a little bit of a step up from normal gestures. And when not to palm, so if you try not to be noticed or questions, hide your palms. So that's quite interesting. So if you're just sitting, going to a meeting, and you know that you're not going to be the main speaker or something like that, just keep your palms to yourself and just let the other people do the talking. Because quite often, you don't always have to be the, 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 the important person at the meeting. You know, if you're going for for instance, at a client brief or something like that, then uh, it's quite important to know that as well. Um, so if you're palming all the time, um, use it purposefully, not consistently. So I think it's a... It's a, it's a secret weapon that you only use at certain times. So I think if you sit and palm like I did just now the whole time, then you guys are going to think this guy's really weird. So I think uh, you have to be very selective. Interesting gestures. So these are quite a few interesting gestures you can use as well. So the first thing is steepling. So this is what the money in the picture is doing. So if I want to share a good idea with you guys, I will come stand like this with my hands like this and immediately draws attention because you think, listen, but what is this guy about to share with me? Uh, I think 
just stuff like big versus small, numbers, you can point numbers with your fingers, me versus you. Uh, bookmarks is quite important. So once again, when you're busy in a meeting and somebody can't stop talking, you can just pause him quickly like that. And as soon as you grab, you, you grab his attention, then you can jump in and say your thing. And then an anchor touch is basically the same thing as well. So if we're sitting around that boardroom table and Mark can't stop talking, then I'll just touch him quickly on his shoulder. He will pause. And as soon as you pause, you jump in and say your thing. So that is just interesting, a couple of interesting gestures that you can use as well. So we're still busy with the first five seconds and we're just busy with hands. <laughs> okay, gestures, here we go. Second part, people love being associated to winners. So I think that is model monikies over there. You can see the girl was victorious and the guy was standing like this over here. And I think this is when I maybe want to touch on phones. I think phones are probably one of the worst things when it comes to gestures. Because if you're busy checking your phone, you go stand like this. So your shoulders are down, you're closing your body, your head is tilted, and you're busy doing this. It's probably the worst thing that you can do when it comes to, um, to, to, to have a proper gesture, like somebody that actually looks like they're, what they're doing. So power pose, pose versus a loser pose. So what to do with your shoulders? Obviously, if you stand like this over here with your arms slouched, your head bent down a little bit, then you don't look like a, like a power player. You obviously have to keep your shoulders back a bit, arms a little bit away from your body, and make sure that you keep your head up. Because, once again, people want to be associated to winners. I was watching a documentary last night of, um, and they were talking about Michael Jackson and, and the rooster guy from Queen, what is his name again? Freddie, um, Mercury. Freddie Mercury. And it's quite interesting, in the one place they were talking about, they did like a charity fundraiser type of a thing in the 1985, somewhere around there. I think it was the only daylight show that he ever did, but when he got onto the stage, there was 110,000 people in that show, and all of that 110 people, 110,000 people standing and clapping with him and stuff. But if you look at his body language, he walked onto that stage as a winner. He didn't walk on as a loser. So if you can get this right to, to, to practice power posing, um, you can win crowds of people's attention just by doing the basics right when it comes to power posing. So that's quite interesting. So this is quite interesting as well. What is the most influential factor for professionals who want to earn the trust of potential clients? So there's four options there. Being an in, uh, established, proven expert, having a high degree of confidence, demonstrating advanced expertise, or having a well-respected reputation. What do you guys think? What's the most important thing there, if you guys had to choose? If you go and see, see an accountant for the first time, which one of those four things will stand out? Confidence. Yeah, confidence yeah. Is, a, is a really interesting thing. Um, one of the guys that was one of my mentors um, <coughs> as an accountant, um, he was actually never qualified. He was qualified as a boilermaker, and he had his boilermaker certificate hanging in his office behind his desk. And probably for the 10 years that I interacted with him, nobody even ever questioned it, never looked at it. But just the way that this guy presented himself, he was 100% confident in every meeting that he walked into. He, he always told me, it's a really bad um, saying, but he always said, fake it till you make it. He said, you never go in front of a client and, and not being sure about what you're doing. As soon as you, they pick up that you're not confident in what you're saying, you've lost the deal. So you have to be 100% sure. When you're in that meeting with a client, you have to be 100% confident in what you're saying. If you're not, and he said, I'd rather go back afterwards and apologize and say, listen, I double-checked this fact and, and it actually doesn't work like this. This is how it's supposed to work. But if you sit in that client meeting for the first hour with that client and, and they pick up that you're unsure about what, what you're busy saying, you've lost it, then the chances are that you're probably not going to close the deal. <coughs> so that's interesting. Yeah, so confidence is really, really important. Why? It's because we want to be associated to winners. So I think that's really important because everybody wants to be on the winning team and everybody likes to be associated to winners. So that's just really interesting. Do's. Um, so when it comes to gestures, I just snipped this out of that book cues that I was talking about now. They're talking about this diagram over here, whereas the charisma cues is the main thing that you're trying to go for. So what's interesting is that if you are somebody that works with technical stuff, now, then you're going to start fo focusing towards this competence thing. So you're going to be doing these type of things more often. You're going to look, be looking at power postures, flex lids. So that's one of those things where people just flex their lids a little bit like this to say that you actually know what you're doing. Uh, the steepling, we were talking about that, explanatory gestures and palm flashes. So if you want to look competent, those are the things that you must do over there. If you're looking at warm skew, so these are the things that make that gives you a more warmer 
personality and that's no, I, I think more people like people that's in schools and stuff because you want to be be more likable to your students and stuff then you will start looking at your warmth warmth cues like tilting it when the, but there's somebody speaking to you nodding in agreement with whatever they're saying eyebrow raises if somebody's sharing an idea and you're quite excited you'll raise your eyebrows a little bit to say listen but i want to listen more to what you're saying smiles touching and mirroring and i think charisma cues so this is the ideal place where you want to try and be is to be leaning so if somebody's sharing an idea with you you don't want to go stand back like this because then you're distancing yourself from that person if, if the guy's busy sharing an idea the idea is to lean in a little bit because then this guy can say listen but you're actually interested in what i'm busy saying fronting so that's quite important as well if i speak to a person like this i don't want to go change my di angle direction because now michelle's standing here talking to me but i'm looking this way then it you're obviously losing the, um, the connection over there, anti-blocking. So quite often people will, st will stand with stuff between them. Um, so if you're going to office, if somebody's got a laptop in front of them, it's like a, something that you use f to block that person away from you. So quite often if you're in a meeting, move your laptop to the side so you haven't got stuff blocking the, the, the view between you and your client like that. And I think one of the, the really cool things that you can use as well, especially when you wear glasses, is if you get to a certain point and you want to really engage with that person, is actually to take your glasses off because you're taking a blocking mechanism away from you. So I can watch you eye to eye and, and engage with you. So that's quite important as well. Gay smarts, so that's really, or oh, space smarts, we were just touching that quickly as well, is how to space yourself in meetings. And I think gazing, but I think that can be a little bit awkward if you do, don't do it right. You don't want to sit and gaze and walk the whole time, because then it just looks weird. Danger zones, we were talking about distancing just briefly like that over there. Self-soothing, so if you sit and rope, drop your arms and stuff like that. Um, blocking, shame, and then bothered <coughs> face. So that's just... Um, the bothered face is an interesting gesture because especially if you're sitting with a client meeting and you see that the guy starts looking bothered, pause and just ask one or two questions. So listen, are you still on track? Is there anything you don't understand? Is there anything you want to discuss further? So you can just make sure that you keep in, them engaged. So this is quite interesting. It's a really nice um, thing to do. So don'ts when it comes to gestures is body blockings. Um, we did talk about phones briefly over there. Mouth blocking as well, biting lips, eye blocking. Uh, Self-comfort and preening is an interesting thing. So preening is a weird definition, but uh, that's especially relevant to the girls. If you sit in a meeting and you sit and fix your hair the whole time and fix, and fix this and do this and adjust this, then people think, hmm, what's, what's up? You know, so just be careful for that. Um, because quite often people do it out of habit. They don't even realize that they're busy doing it. Um, and nose and lying. So I think they were talking about one of the American presidents who was caught out in a scandal um, we, he was, what was the name, Sawinski or something like that? Yes, yeah, so with that interview that they did. So they, so they counted when, when they did that interview with him, when they asked him the first time, he, he touched his nose 26 times in that interview. So the thing with Pinocchio is actually a little bit true. So as soon as, <laughs> so as, soon as you start lying, then people do, your, warm, your, your nose actually warms up a bit. I think nervous gestures as well, you've got to be careful over there, distancing, turning away. Runner's feet, so this is quite interesting. If you're sitting in a meeting like Michelle and Andre are sitting, they're sitting relaxed with their legs, sitting like that over there. A runner's feet, if you sit in a meeting and somebody's sitting with their, <laughs> with their feet like this, then it looks like they, they're ready to run. So this is, you've got to be careful for this because it looks like you're heading towards the door, you want to get out of here. <laughs> yeah, that's good. You're not running, you, you're a little bit twisted over there. <coughs> Glancing. This is also interesting gesture. There was one interview that they did with um, with two American presidents. You know, they always have those presidential debates. So the I think it was like Nixon and somebody else. So they analyzed their body gestures. The the one that that that, that lost that interview or that the that, that debate uh, were both showing runners' feet, and the other one is it was glancing. So they had a camera. They had a person in the middle, and they, they had two candidates standing on the side. And the one that lost was sitting with runners' feet. The other guy was sitting nice and relaxed. And the one that lost was glancing the whole time at his opponents. Instead of engaging with the camera, he was busy staring at his opponent the whole time like this. And um, so then the audience, the people busy watching the video, then uh, this guy is not truthful. He looks nervous. You know, he was sitting rubbing his arms, uh, his legs like this. He was glancing to his opponent, and that's where he lost the interview. Uh, what's the interview? The debate. Uh, I think that's the right word. Um, eye contact. So we're still busy with the first five seconds. 
This one, I'm not going to spend too long time on this, holds 6 to 7% of the time. It builds trust and is a measure of engagement as well because you'll see as soon as people start becoming, um, they start doubting what they're saying, they'll drop their eyes and then, they'll, then you know, listen, something's not right. This person is not confident in what they're saying. So this is a nice little interesting thing where they talk about gazing power, power gazing. So if you sit in business meetings, don't sit and look at the people's chest down here. You know, keep it to the eyes and the forehead and stuff like that. Social gazing is when you start looking at people's mouths as well to see what they're saying. And then obviously intimate gazing is what you do with your wife. So that's uh, interesting. Um, first five minutes. So now we introduced ourselves. First five, five seconds, first two seconds. We aced that thing now. We know what to do with the hands, our body posture and those type of things. First five minutes. So there's three things that you want to try and do when you meet somebody and you start chatting to that person as you want to create the three things. You want to create spark, you want to highlight stuff, and you want to create intrigue. So those are the three main things that you have to focus for when you're going spark. Um, so conversation sparks, and it releases dopamine. So if I walk in here and I start speaking to Andre, I say, yo, it's a weird weather that we've got today. Um, that is like a, a nullable contract. It doesn't mean anything to anybody. But if I, but if I come to Andre and say, listen, Andre, what was your highlight of the week? Um, I had a meeting now in the week um, with that, I, the, the, that I had with a potential client, and we were just talking, and, um, and, and I could feel that we, the, the conversation started drifting. There was a little bit of a shift in interest in that. And then I think we started talking a little bit about studies and stuff, and then I just a question popped up. I said, listen, do you like reading? And uh, immediately I could see it sparked something in, the eye, in, in his eyes, and I could say, okay, now I've got his attention. So we just started talking about books, you know. What was the best book that you read lately? You know, is there something that you want to share? What stood out in the book for you? So I just sparks, because I think if you create sparks with people, then they remember you. I think that's the main thing. So stuff that you can say is highlight of your day, week, or, or versus weird weather. Um, I think uh, push hot buttons, so personal passion projects, books and hobbies. So I just share quickly with you guys like that. So... Um, and I think especially you guys that's in construction, this is something that you guys can use because you walk into somebody's premises, as soon as you walk into somebody's house, you can see what these guys are doing. So if you see there's a boat standing over there, say, hey, I see you guys have a boat, do you guys enjoy fishing? And immediately this guy says, listen, but this guy is actually interested in me as a client instead of just coming just to get my money to build something for them. So I think that is something practical that you can use, names, um, especially for people that, that battle with names. Yo, um, I'm not always good with names, especially when meeting new people. So what I would normally do is when, remember I talked to you about it just now, that I use three mediums of communication. I put everything down, focus fully on my client that I'm busy with, I gesture and I'm using pens and stuff, but I use a piece of paper where I do drawings and stuff like that as well, or just uh, what I want to explain. But then at the top of that paper, I'll write the business's name and I'll write the person's name that I'm busy writing with. So if um, today's events is used, uh, Andre is an example, I would write at the big, at the top of the page, Speak Academy, Andre Voliter, because then I know that I can just look at my page and I know exactly who I'm speaking about. I think that's one of the weirdest things. If you try and look at somebody and think, what the heck is this guy's name? <laughs> <laughs> then that's not good. So I think, yeah, just practical things, meet and repeat, um, spell, associate and anchor. I think Steve Reed also talked about that last, quickly, last week. Um, Highlight. So this is the second one. So if you want to highlight certain things. So to be interesting, be interested. Um, I think if you walk into a client meeting and you make it everything about you, then you're going to lose the client. You have to show interest in what those guys are about. Remember, they're the guys that's going to be paying you money, not the other way around. So you have to be interested in what's happening in them, in their businesses. Uh, best conversation isn't about what you say, but about what you hear. People love talking about themselves. So the more you can get people to speak about themselves, the better. I remember I w went to a, a meeting once um, at Auditors uh, over the mountain at PKF and um, there was a certain issue with the non-profit organization that we were trying to sort out. So just the way that this guy ran the meeting was really interesting because we came in, I went in with my client, we sat down and he just introduced himself briefly. He said, listen, this is my name, what can I help you with today? And he just kept quiet. He just zipped it. He didn't make any comments or anything like that. He waited probably for 20 minutes for us just to stipulate and say, this is the problem, this is what we're betting with. He didn't interrupt, he didn't ask questions, anything. He waited for us to finish our talk. And then he said, okay, let me explain to you guys how this works. And then he started with these things. So he wasn't interrupting us. He was giving us time to, to share the, the ideas. And I do it quite often as well when I meet new clients. As at first, I don't talk about myself first. I talk about them and say, listen, yeah, it's amazing that you guys are starting your first business. Give me a little bit of background. Why are you doing this? What sparked this interest? 
what is the reason why doing this? Have you got expertise in this area? And as soon as you see that they start talking about themselves and they start feeling happy, then you can say, okay, listen, the, the main thing for accountants is, is that you, people walk into your office and they don't know what their needs are. So they heard somewhere that they need to, 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 to have an accountant. We'll talk about it just now as well. But in that first hour when I meet with a new client, I make them aware of what they what, what the needs are because they don't know what they have to do when it comes to SARS and that type of stuff. And then the, the second part is I show them how I can fulfill the needs for them. So I think if you can do those two things, you've got the client hooked. So that's interesting. Uh, businessmen, um, I think this is really important. It's not about you because most business people are normally quite confident people as well. So if you're in the construction, I'm just using that as an example, you'll walk into this building and say, oh, but the way that these beams are done is, is incorrectly and you start offending the person and stuff like that. Then the chances are they're not going to get that person to sign up as, for, as a client. We just keep your opinion to yourself, wait for him to explain to you this thing and then you can start looking at those things in alternative ways to correct the person and not to just talk about you and your expertise. Um, highlight their strengths, bring the best out in people, thanking them, etc. So that's really important as well. And I think being memorable is not about bringing up your hard points, but it's a bringing up theirs. Um, don't try and impress people, let people impress you. So I think once again, just that engagement that you have with people. If you give them chance to impress you, then the chances are that you're going to look him as a client. Um, where were we? And don't try and make others look bad. It reflects on you. So I think this is one thing that I've seen quite often um, with with accountants is, is when people change from 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 accountants one person to another person, then then quite often <coughs> some some accountants it's very easy to find faults in in somebody else's work. So they will look at something and say, "Oh, but this guy never did this right, or this is not in the right place, or they should have done that differently." But as soon as you start going down there, it actually starts making make you look bad. So you have to try and avoid that. So don't try and find fault in what the previous guy did wrong. Rather focus on what you can do right when you're going forward. So I think that's just, because at the end of the day, it reflects on you. Um, uh, intrigue. Um, so the similarity effect. So you have to look for, 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 for opportunities to create a moment where you can say, me too. So it is it's just you know, our example, when you guys walk into somebody's property and you see there's a boat standing over there and you say, listen, do you enjoy fishing? He would say, yes, I love fishing. He'd say, hey, me too. And then he can start talking a little bit about fishing. I'm just using that as an example. But there's three steps that he can use over here. Search for threats. So people, context, or interest. So those are things that he can use possibly. So if you, um, let's say, for instance, you you have a, like, the, like um, the, a web design business or something like that, then he can start chatting about like SEO stuff and so on because obviously if somebody wants to uh, employ services to do a web design for them, then obviously you have to talk in terms of their interest, you know. Um, uh, so you can ask the question, why expand, follow the threat and ask questions and create ties. So tie your abilities to their needs. So I think especially if you're trying to sell something, people in construction, this is where you guys come in because they're sitting with needs and you've got the ability to fulfill those needs. So you have to try and find a way to link those two things together. So now, at last, we get into what we're actually supposed to talk about today. So, <laughs> so I just laid the foundation quickly. I think it's important to understand that before we start looking at this. Um, let me just have a quick sip of water. Mm. So three steps. <coughs> when leads come through, first meetings and then follow-ups. So when you leads come through, I say, always say to people, mm, so I've got that website, SA County Network, and I've got the YouTube channel that's got the same name as well. But on the website itself, I've got a network of a there's probably about 50 accountants that's registered on this. almost like a business registry that we generate leads for those guys. So they will get a copy of the lead, and then I obviously get a copy of the lead as well. So quite often when I speak to the guys over there, then, then the lead will come through, but people won't respond immediately. So they will wait until tomorrow morning before they reply to that, to that inquiry that comes through. But the thing is, that person that submitted that thing is looking for something specific. So if you're looking for accounting services, you say, listen, but I might have a tax problem. You start Googling around, submit the form. Now, by tomorrow morning, you're busy focusing on something else, schoolwork or whatever it is. Now that person forgot that he's looking for an accountant, you see. So if you only send a reply email or something like that the next day, then it's too late. So in the I remember I did a medical course, a first aid course first, a uh, first aid course a couple of years ago, and they talk about a magic hour in terms of first aid. And I think in terms of sales, you also have a magic hour. So if that person submits that inquiry on your website, 
30 minutes later, you should be on the phone speaking to that person and organizing the first meeting because if you delay, then you're probably going to lose that thing because if you follow up a week later, then it's going to be too late Then that person has moved on. So that's really important. I think especially in Cape Town, I don't know why, but in service delivery, I don't know why people are so slack over here because I remember our gate motor bro broke a while ago and um, found three companies. No, they said, no, they'll definitely come out. They can come do a quote for me, come look and see what, what it will cost and stuff. I think the one guy had an appointment like a Friday afternoon, 2 o'clock, he never pitched. Like the next week, Wednesday, he phoned me back and said, listen, do you still want the gate motor? I said, come on, you know, can't do it like that. You know, so you have to be really, really quick. You know, if the guy sends a lead through this morning, by this afternoon, you should have him signed up as a client already. He mustn't waste time with this. And um, strike the iron while it's hot. And um, have a game plan where now this is really, really important as well. So if you meet clients for the first time, you have to work in a place that you are comfortable with. Um, so if I'm... Um, meet a client, I don't like meeting them the first time in a place that's very noisy because it means that I have to raise my voice for them to hear them. So likely I would not meet a client like in a place like a peak in a coffee shop where there's a lot of clinging and banging around because now I have to raise my voice to engage with this person. Then I'll say to Mark, listen guys, can I use the boardroom upstairs where it's nice and quiet? We, I can fully engage with this guy. There's no distractions or anything like that. Um, other people, like I say, it's up to them, um, but it's important to have a game plan to try and find a place where you feel comfortable. It's the same as um, meeting a new client and say, let's, let's, go for, let's go to a pub. You know, I mean, that won't be wise to do those type of things. You know, you want to try and find a place where you are the most confident in engaging with, with clients. I think that's really important as well. And especially when it comes to online stuff, we'll talk a little bit about online stuff as well, is to make sure that you've got a game plan if you do online meetings with clients. You don't want to be sitting in your spare room with a lot of clutter behind you and bad lighting and people can't hear you and that type of stuff. Then you're going to lose that client. So make sure before the time you look at your space that you're going to be using for your online meeting. Make sure it's decluttered. Make sure you've got proper lighting. Make sure that the sound is working. You don't want to appear in, a, in an online meeting and it looks like you're fiddling around and trying to get the camera to work and that type of stuff. You must be, pre 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 be prepared. Um, in person or online, so impressions and pre-meetings as well. So this is also really important. If somebody sends an email through or let's say instance, they submit a form on your website as well as your your correspondence look with that person um you know do you just send them an email from a random gmail account that's got nothing related to your business or do you write them a proper email um, a properly worded email with a nice email signature like that with references to your website and maybe a link where they can go look at your previous work and stuff because now the guy gets the thing back and says, yo, but this guy actually looks like he knows what he's doing. He's not just like a like fly by night type of a thing, you know. So that, that first impression, we did talk about it just now, but it's really, really critical even before you meet that person for the first time because once again, you only have one chance to make a first impression. Oh dear, I've got a rush. Um, technology, Google Meetings, stuff like Calendly and stuff like that. It's worth it to go check that out as well. I love using Calendly because in, on that program, I say that what are the times that I'm available, the guys can go onto that thing and make an appointment with me for whenever they want. That thing sends automated responses to say, listen guys, thanks for the booking. We're seeing each other next week, next week, Friday at 9.30 in the morning. Make sure that you've got these programs installed. Make sure you've got this information ready for me. Then it just speeds up the whole process. Meeting somebody for the first time, first impressions really matter, whether it's online or in person. We did speak about that quickly as well. Be on time. I think this is one of the basic things, and a lot of people miss this thing. If you're not early, you are late. And the thing is, if you want to impress a client, you can't be late on your first meeting. You have to make sure that you're on time. If you do, for some reason, do run late, then let the guy know. And say, listen, guy, just send them a message and say, listen, I'm running a bit late. I had a meeting. I'm going to be there in 30 minutes at least so people know what to expect. Um, I remember there's a friend of mine that uses Google Maps. He's a financial advisor, and he actually sends them a link from Google Maps itself where they can track his progress. So now you as the client get this link, and you can see on the phone, okay, but you want this 10 minutes where I can see it's just around the corner in Musenberg or whatever. Then you know when to expect the car. So that's something nice that you can use as well. Make them feel important. I think that he's the guy that's going to be paying you money, so obviously... He's your guest. You have to make sure that you make him feel important. Remember names. Be sympathetic to the ideas and desires and highlight the needs and how you can fulfill them. We're talking about the texting now. When people come into my office the first time, they don't even know what the needs are. So I explain to them, these are the three different types of taxes you have to be aware of. These are the deadlines. This is what you're supposed to be doing and this is how I can fulfill your needs for you. So that's important. Um, first time meetings. 
confidence. We did talk about that just now with the gesture stuff. You have to be confident in what you're saying to a person. You can't go and sit in him and R and, and not know what you're doing. There are certain incidents or certain instances where you're going to meet people for the first time. Let's say, for instance, like for me as an accountant, I, there's certain things that I don't work with. I don't work with non-for-profits. I don't work with trust and that type of stuff. I've made a decision 20 years ago already that I'm never going to touch those type of things just because of the complexity and the risk that's involved with that. So if I have somebody that comes to sit in my office and they start talking about trust and stuff that I've got no knowledge about, I tell them up front, so listen, this is an area that I've got limited theoretical knowledge with, but I've got a network of people around me that's definitely going to be able to assist you. So I tell my people that I see myself as a GP, that know a little bit about everything, but I don't specialize in any specific areas. If you go to a doctor and he sees something on his skin and he's not sure what that is about, he's going to send you a specialist and he's not going to think bad of that doctor and think the doctor doesn't know what he's doing. So it's the same with me as well. So if I see something like this and you come to me with trust questions or non-for-profit questions and stuff, I'm going to be honest and say, listen, I've got limited knowledge on this, but I know the right person that can help you, then I'll refer them to auditors and stuff like that that can assist them. So even if you're not sure, there's still a way to, to come across confident to a potential client. Now, what's your tone of voice? You don't want to sit and shout at a person, and I think that's where you do the meetings is important. You know, if you meet a guy in a noisy coffee shop, then it's not good because you have to raise your voice the whole time. Can't speak too soft as well because otherwise people have to concentrate on what you're saying, so you must make sure that you are audible. Um, avoid being opinionated. <coughs> it makes you look bad. We did talk about that as well. Make sure that you listen well. Talks in terms of interest. We did touch on that as well. And taking notes is important as well because quite often people will <coughs> have a long list of stuff to do. There's a, for instance, like a guys in construction. You walk into a site and now they want to have the pool done and they want to have a wall done and this and that. And you don't take notes. When you get back home and you've got to send that quote to the guy and I think, flip, what do I have to do again? You know, it's just the pool. I must do the pool and the wall. I'm just using that as an example. So important to take notes. The follow-up. So this is the third one over there. Mm, you must make sure that you send that quote or that email as soon as possible. What I normally do is if I meet somebody for the first time and that person, as soon as the meeting finishes and he jumps in his car and he starts driving back, I jump behind my computer and I write them a summary of what we discussed. So by the time he gets back home and he opens up his email, he's already got my first response of what we discussed in the meeting with potential stuff, let's say, for instance, like a quote or something like that. Because if you're going to leave it until the next day or a week later, you're going to forget what you discussed in that meeting. And it also makes you look good. You know, if you can follow up as soon as possible, then people, it, it just creates a good impression on your business. Personalize your follow up as well. So that's um, what I did discuss about as well. Just try and do it as quick as possible. And don't, don't send them like a, a, a random, just like a catalogus or something like that, you know, just say, but here's all my pricing and you can choose yourself. But, but try and make it personalize the thing because they obviously spend an hour with the guy. So you don't want to just send them just some random information. You want to try and personalize your offering that you're giving to that person. Um, <coughs> offer value pricing options. So this is also an interesting thing. So if Legit Ventures for Accounting Services, um, somebody comes to me and they say that they are starting a business, this is what they need to be done and we just do compliance work. So this is VAT returns, some pays you earn, some company tax return. This is the basic package that it's going to cost just to keep you compliant. But now, if we start looking at value pricing, then I say, listen, but over and above what I can do, I can keep you compliant and that's my first priority, but let's maybe look at additional stuff. You know, I've been in the accounting industry 20 years, so let's, let's maybe work in a management meeting once a month where we can do a finance meeting together, me and you. It's going to cost the extra thousand rand per month, but at least you know that you've got an accountant looking at your books every month. Then you can start saying, okay, let's do cash flow projections. Every month I can help you with the cash flow projection, extra thousand rand per month. So instead of just giving them the option of just what they want, you can give them additional options. So if you're looking at building, if you've got somebody calls you to come and build a wall and you say, you see that the paving is looking shocking, then you can say, listen, but let me send you a quote to fix the paving as well. And then the guy said, yeah, but this guy's actually doing more than what I'm asking for. So value pricing, I think that is a whole talk on itself, but it's really, really interesting for business people. Of additional information, we did talk about that briefly, and I think timelines is really important as well because people will get excited, come into your office, you come and do the, the, the meeting, and then all of a sudden um, you say, okay, this and this and this is going to happen, but you don't set a timeline to that, then you're also probably going to lose that client because you don't know about when you're going to fulfill whatever it is you said. So if you look at like web design and stuff like that as well, so I think this is a really nice thing that can that you can set you aside from other people, you know, because if they have to start waiting too long for you to fulfill what you said, it's not good. 
under promise and over deliver i think this is one of the 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 key things that we as business people have to aim for is to make sure that we over deliver on what we promise if i said something is going to take two weeks try and finish it in one week but don't tell the guy listen it's going to take two days and then it takes three three weeks i remember my assistant when we moved when she moved down to cape town she had to redo a bathroom and um, so there was a guy busy fixing it, and he said, no, it's going to take two weeks to get the bathroom fixed. At the end of the day, I think it almost took two months to finish that bathroom. And we'd walk in there, and then the guy's busy sleeping on the ground. He said, listen, dude, what are you doing? Now I'm waiting for the cement to dry. I mean, <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that's basically the talk. And these are the two books that I refer to. The one is Captivate, and the other one is Q. So a lot of the stuff that I took into this talk I got out of these two books. So the one on the left-hand side, I actually made a summary of that book. It's like a, probably about a four-page summary. So quite often before I go into client meetings, I would go through my summaries and say, listen, let me just check up and just make sure that I, I, know, I remember about this, remember to check on, up on this thing, make sure that I do this when I engage with clients. So this is one of my, um, <clears throat> my, my acts that I figured out over the years, and it's just something that really works for me. So if you guys are interested in something like this, I would highly recommend them. And then, that is the end of my talk. Is there any questions, any comments from your side, anything that you want to add or